Hi, I'm Thomas and welcome back to Stylized Station. Longtime viewers of the channel know that I occasionally bring talented artists onto the platform to share their knowledge and show off their work. So when I saw Melissa's stylized watermill scene, I knew I had to ask her if she wanted to collaborate. In this video, our good friend Melissa is going to show us how she creates her lively and vibrant scenes in Unreal Engine and share some cool tips and tricks that you can use when building your own environments. This is going to be a fun video. If you want to learn how to make environments like this yourself, feel free to check out my beginner environment art course and texturing course. Melissa gets a cut of all sales from this video, so make sure to use her link in the description if you want to consider getting my courses. Okay, let's get into the video. Hello, my name is Melissa. I am a 3D artist and I've so kindly been invited to share my creative workflow when working on the stylized scene in Unreal. I will be going over my general scene building process first, which includes the planning phase like concept and blockouts and showing my work in progress. Then I'll go into how I approach making my 3D models as well as texturing them. And then I'll give an overview on how I approach technical aspects like shaders. In my workflow, I used Unreal 4, Blender, Substance Designer, and Substance Painter. Starting from the beginning, my planning phase for the scene was relatively short. I just knew I wanted to use the environment shaders I made prior to this project. So the scene should be set somewhere in nature and preferably include a water port and I thought a water mill would be a lovely setting. While looking for references, I found a nice water mill that was set into this building space, which I really liked. For the wheel itself, I wanted to go a bit more into this direction. And then I also found this unrelated treehouse, where I like the wooden material, and I think I also used this as inspiration for my roof tiles. I have an easier time with shapes in 3D than when drawing, so I made a block out first and used it to paint over. You can already tell the first building I made from it changed quite a bit within the process, but I mostly used the concept for figuring out what textures I want and what building pieces I would need. I mostly deserted it afterwards, but it was very helpful in the beginning. So from my concept sketch, I color-coded how I wanted to divide my work. For example, I decided to not model out the roof tiles, but fake them with textures, but model out one of the wood beams and use it for most of the wind structure involved. Looking at it this way, the amount of modeling for singular pieces is already reduced by quite a bit. Beginning working on a bigger model can be quite intimidating, so it helps me to note these things down properly. The next step for me was to make the tileable textures I decided on. I like doing this early because they cover a huge chunk of the overall model, so having them applied to the blockout while still working on it can give me a pretty good idea on how it's going to look. I also like matching the materials for my models to keep consistency. After this point, I imported the blockout to Unreal to focus on the environment before committing to the structure. I left the mill alone for now, it was probably one of the later things I finished. One of the decisions I made while building the environment was that the mill was too small for my liking and I wanted a bit more interesting structure. For the foreground, I made a path that leads towards the building to guide the eye a bit and I also placed another type of structure in the distance, if you can spy it back there, to connect the path and to give a feeling of continuity for whatever lies behind the water mill. When I was at the point where I started modeling on the building again and had some of the first pieces, I also invested some time in lighting it a bit nicer. At some point I changed camera angles because there was too much going on on both sides of the background and I got some nice advice to concentrate on the left side that viewed into the distance. Especially the area on the left was still quite empty, so I finally took out the tree blocking the view and placed a smaller tree cluster here with the intention to suggest a forest edge. I then placed some smaller tree clusters in the areas between the buildings that would make the landscape easier to recognize. One of the earlier models that I finished was probably the water wheel, as it was such a key feature for me. I wanted to not only have it modeled out, but also moving in the scene early on. Even though everything else was still half finished, having the little part of my scene that felt alive already was a huge motivation. For getting it to turn, I just made a new blueprint actor class. Setting up a simple movement like 360 degree turn is super easy. So I just dragged in my water wheel model under here and used the rotating movement component, which can stay where it is. Then to correct the rotation direction, I changed the input from the z-axis to the y-axis. And also changed the speed by lowering this value. To use it in the scene, I just have to drag in the blueprint actor instead of the model. Now coming back to the textures, because I made those very early on as well, I'll quickly go over the wood plank material, because it was very straightforward. I started out with a tile sampler to give me the base frame to work with and mixed out the color random to get the variation in the planks. Then I warped it just a tiny bit because you want to avoid completely straight lines. 
This still reads as a straight line, but the little irregularities in it are needed. I level out the grayscale so it's a bit more even, and then blend in the noise. I used anisotropic noise, as it's already made up of straight lines, to create a few more straight patterns. When adding any type of noise for bigger surfaces, I mostly used the cell 4 node, and like I did here, warp it with a plasma node. This is kind of the same as slope blur, but it gives sharper edges, and I like using highly contrasted noise. Usually I add two layers of noise, one on a smaller scale for the details up close, and one on a bigger scale that's a bit easier to recognize from further away. I go by this rule in my materials for my models as well, just as a baseline because you don't want to overdo it with noise. For the extra details, I made a mask of the edges in between the planks by using Edge Detect, and used them as a mask to blend in little holes and scratches, because I didn't want them to be everywhere and distract from the vertical flow. They also had another purpose, I gave them a color and blended them over the rest of the coloring to indicate as highlights. They're barely visible, but it looks a bit different if they're not there. I also use a curvature smooth node that's derived from the normal map to get a prettier grayscale than this. But obviously the normals got rid of my color variations, so I made a separate gradient map and blended them over my colored grayscale. Then added some more color variation. For the roughness, I level out my result to a pretty even value, and then blend in some extra noise. So the light will catch the material on different points. I exaggerate a lot on that, in the end you don't really end up seeing it that much, but I like the little bit of extra texture that it gives. When setting up the textures, getting the height to work in Substance Designer is fairly easy by going into settings here. But to use the height map properly in Unreal, I use Parallax Occlusion Mapping. It's performance heavier than the other solutions, but I preferred it this way. I think the way it works is that the material fakes the height by placing multiple iterations of the texture above each other, based on the height map. So it doesn't change your model's geometry and doesn't need vertices to deform. It's a bit of a tedious setup, but if you're unhappy with your textures looking flat outside of substance, that will help. I've mostly seen it used for ground textures, they make looking at them from an angle a bit nicer. The part that covered the next biggest surface after the textures were the wood beams. I would reuse them a lot, so I modeled them in a way I could tile the textures and use them in different sizes without stretching their UVs. So I made a beam that's 8 units high, and when sculpting I came down here under symmetry, where it says tiling, and set this to 8 as well. That way it would repeat, so if I set this to 4, it would repeat twice. When texturing it in substance, I made sure the scale of any noise I used also would be a whole unit size so the texture can tell properly. Now if I scale the model up by 2, I can scale the UV map on this axis as well. That way I can use the wood beam in different lengths. And as I mentioned, I try to avoid super straight lines, so I use this wood beam as a base and then alter it to get rid of the straight lines when using it for a model. Since I used the material I made for the roof tiles instead of modeling them out, to give them a bit of a nicer silhouette, I made some single tiles and placed the UVs on the roof tile texture. A bit of a cheap trick, but very helpful when working on game assets. When sculpting or modeling, I mostly care about the outer shape. Smaller surface details, I like setting up in substance if I can. With bigger models like the wheel, I also only sculpted the edges of parts and left the details up to substance. When texturing my models, the first thing I like to do is add stylized lighting. By making a new layer, and without a mask, add a filter that's called baked stylized lighting. And turn off everything but color. Since this is quite extreme, I set the layer opacity down to around 20 or 30. Also, because I usually keep the layer at the top, I set the layer to soft light, since I don't want it to affect the layers below it too much. It gives the model a bit more grip to it. In this case, it actually didn't make sense because the wheel would be turning and the light wouldn't be correct, but it was overall not that noticeable, so I left it in for the effect. The base layer's roughness is usually set to somewhere in between 0.75 or a bit higher. When then adding noise to my materials, I make a fill layer with a random noise and either slope blur or warp it. I set the material height slightly down, not to the point where it gets noticeable, this is again mostly to make the light catch the model a bit differently. I also offset the roughness slightly to a different value for the same reason. And since I usually have two noise layers, I vary the roughness in the second one again, but usually leave out the height because I don't want it to get too messy. Then I add two highlights, one a bit softer and broader, and the other one a bit smaller and more contrasted. With models like this I like to keep my edges clean, only the softer one is slope blurred a little bit. I don't want to distract too much from the edges, since it's a mechanical asset and nothing very organic. 
so the bit stricter feeling to it is what I'm going for. Then the ambient occlusion, which is nice for intricate models as, again, it gets a bit more grip to it. I try not having too many layers or adding too much detail because it just ends up messy. The material for the wheel where I did this all properly consists of the base layer with the base color and the roughness setting. My normal masks with details for the wooden surfaces. The main noise layer with the little height and roughness offset. And in this case I also added a softer noise for the wood effect. Usually I also add a noise for just color variation, which are these blue splotches. Then come the highlights, a pretty heavy ambient occlusion and the stylized lighting. Since the wheel would be moving, I couldn't add any gradients onto the texture, but I placed some point lights in the scene to make it a bit more interesting to look at. Coming back to the point lights, this is how I lit up my scene. It's absolutely not realistic and not how lights would work. I have blue lights where shadows would be and yellowish lights where there is no real light source. I think since it's stylized, I can get away with it. This is how it would have looked like without the fake point lights. There are probably some shadows here I should have kept to make it more obvious to where the light is actually coming from. Good lighting is a big part of making a scene look appealing, and it's still a bit intimidating to me with all the settings. But some important ones were the light source or directional light. As the name says, depending on how you rotate it, it will change the sunlight's direction. And then the intensity setting, of course, is important as well. Then also the post-process volume for general control over contrasts, colors, it basically works as a filter. Super important for stylized things. This is one of the first things that should be set up in the scene, as it sets the tone for everything on screen. And a bit of track, but I also used exponential height fog. This is what fades out everything in the distance here. If there's not some sort of fading in the distance and faraway objects are super clear to see, it will not look right as it's not how we see things. I'm sure there's a lot more to it, that's mostly what I can think of right now, but lighting and some scene settings are definitely worth investing time into. For some more technical things, I'd be taking a look at some of my shaders now. The setup for my leaves was very simple, as I didn't want to spend too much time with it. It's basically just a top to bottom gradient. This is the leaf material in its most basic form, just a very simple leaf alpha plugged into the opacity mask and a single color plugged into the emission so I don't have to bother with shadows. And I used a red channel to fix my normals. But as one color looks very flat, I wanted to at least use the gradient that would go from 1 to 0, so from top to bottom of the mesh, so the gradient would always be dependent on the size of the object. For that I used the bounding box node and its blue output, as that determines the z-axis, so green or red would go side to side. Then divided it by a parameter that controls the position of the gradient, and used the cheap contrast node for the gradient's contrast. I think of these two nodes as the same thing Substance does with its generators. They're called balance and contrast over there, so that's what I named them here as well. This gradient is used as the alpha for the layer between my top and bottom color. Also, to get some movement in the leaves and grass, which is always nice to have, I used the simple grass wind note, which is specifically for simulating that. I left the values for these three inputs at 1, and promoted them all to parameters so I can more easily control them outside the material window. The alpha from the leaf mask goes here, and then that goes into the world position offset. That's where I left it. If you want a bit more detail, it will probably improve the overall look, but this was enough for me. Before starting on the water shader, I wrote a list of what specifics I wanted. It wasn't specifically made for any scene, so it needed to be adjustable. I wanted my water to still look stylized, but also have a bit of fluid feel to it. So I parted it in six main features. Handling the opacity, the contrasted white form edge, and the noise coming from the water edge, the water surface normals, and the water refraction, which is the distortion you can see when objects underwater tend to look a bit wonky, and I used the refraction as well for the fluid looking waves also coming from the edges. I'm not going too much into detail with the water shader as it's quite big, but I'm going through a few points. First the water edge, which is a smaller setup. These nodes are how to determine the distance between any object the water plane hits, which is what creates an outline. <laughs> 
Similar to the gradient, there is this parameter here that controls the size or distance of the water edge, and another parameter to control the contrast of the edge by using a cheap contrast node. I then again use this as an alpha to lerp between, in this case, these two colors. The waves coming from the edges also need that information, and I use the balance a lot as a mask to cut off some of the other effects off. So they only show up within a certain distance. If you think of these setups as masks, there's a lot you can do with it. The opacity uses a different information, which is depth fade. It determines the behavior of how the material intersects. If I set the material band mode to translucent, right now the opacity is at the value 1, which is completely opaque. If I set this to 0, it will be completely transparent. But if I want something in between those values, say 0 0.5, it will look something like this. However, water gets less or more transparent in certain areas, and it's not perfectly see-through. So to simulate that, I need an expression to tell the opacity, the information where to be opaque, and where to be transparent. For that I use the depth fade node. What I wanted to do for me right now is to blend between the value 0 and 1, so I can use it as a mask or alpha. It's already kind of doing what I want, but right now the edge line doesn't show up anymore because the border transparency value is basically 0. First of all, I don't actually want it to lerp between 1 and 0, but between 1 and the mask for the edge. Because this mask is already the value 0, except it has the edge cut out. So it will go over the rest of the opacity. And to have better control over the overall transparency, I clamp it. This makes sure the minimum or maximum opacity will never go past a certain value. Right now it's set to 0 and 1, which is the same what we have already. But if I change the minimum to say 0 0.5 again, the outer water borders opacity, which was 0 before, gets a bit more opaque. The same way I can control the maximum value, which right now is still 1, so completely opaque, but if lowered, we'll also make sure that the deeper parts of the water never goes completely opaque. I have multiple layers of the same concept set up to also change the color of the water based on the depth. And again, as long as you have the information figured out once, you can use it for different things. The refraction, which I think is more performance heavy, so maybe not ideal for games, was another attempt to make the water feel more liquid. I didn't want it to look perfectly even, real water distorts, so even if I'm not going for realism, that's a pretty big part of the liquid feel I wanted to include. I also used this input and a combination of the water edge mask to make the fluid looking ripples coming from the water edge. There are a lot more intricate parts to the water shader, but these were some of the important information it needs. The way I approached the scene isn't necessarily the right way to do it. I'm sure there are smarter solutions to get to some of the same results, but my process on the scene was relatively loose. I kind of improvised as I went along, it was nice having my freedom during working on it, and there was a lot of room for me to experiment. I also spent time on a few things that didn't end up working, but I would love to use for future projects. Thank you very much for taking the time to go through my process, I hope there's a few things at least you could take away from it. I'm over at ArtStation if there's any questions or corrections, so thank you very much.